All right, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Caroline Slider. I am the program director of the Old Ways Whole Grains Council. And we're very excited to have um, this great webinar lined up today called Expert Tips for Crave Worthy Food Photography. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with Old Ways, Old Ways is a nonprofit dedicated to improving public health by inspiring individuals and organizations to embrace the healthy, sustainable joys of the old ways of eating. We are most well known for creating the Mediterranean Diet Pyramid in partnership with the Harvard School of Public Health and for creating the Whole Grain Stamp Program. The Whole Grains Council is a program of old ways and we help consumers to find whole grains, to understand their benefits. Uh, we, we help manufacturers and restaurants to create more and better whole grain foods. And we help the media to write accurate and compelling stories about whole grains. As I mentioned before, you might be familiar with our iconic gold and black whole grain stamp the packaging symbol that displays the gram amount of whole grain in one serving of a product. So before we dive in, I want to go over just a few housekeeping notes first. Yes, this session is being recorded. Video recordings and slides will be posted on our website within one week. You can find the recording at oldwayspt.org slash CPEU, as well as on the Whole Grains Council website, wholegrainscouncil.org. For registered dietitians in the audience today, attendance qualifies you for one CE CPEU credit. You will receive a follow-up email within one week which will tell you how to claim your CPEU certificate. In fact, everyone will get an email within one week with links to the slides and recording as soon as they're available. During the presentation, all attendees are automatically muted. So if you have questions for the presenters or you need to get in touch with us, you can just type your questions into the chat box. We will have time at the very end for a brief Q&A. <clears throat> we hope that you'll join us later this month for our next webinar, which will be all about sorghum. That's happening on September 21st. And now it's time to dive right in and start learning more about food photography and the best ways to capture whole grain dishes to entice and uh, inspire your friends and followers so without further ado, we will let Kristen Teig uh, kick things off. Hi everyone, my name is Kristen Teig and I photograph food for cookbooks, restaurants, and brands. And when I first started out, I only used natural light, a tripod, and a few light modifiers. So I'm hoping that in this short bit of time we have today, I can give you a few tips and ways to look at light differently, um, no matter what tool you're using, whether you are using a camera or an iPhone, um, I will say, if you can override your camera's automatic exposure settings, whether you're shooting manually on your camera or on the iPhone app, you can adjust it. Um, or even there's a Lightroom photography app where you can kind of get in there and use more manual settings. That that will help give you a little more control. So um, here we go. These are the three things that I really think make up the best images, and that would be quality of light, quality of composition, and quality of content. So if I'm traveling and shooting uh, photojournalism, the content is very important. And it might be that the light is not so great, 
but I need to really focus on that storytelling and what I can do with composition. Um, alternatively, if your content or maybe it's, it's food that's not the most attractive, you can really elevate it by knowing how to see it in the most flattering light in a composition that makes it more interesting. So though I now use studio lights to replicate natural light, the same principles apply and I treat the light source like I'm using the sun. When I started out and was only using natural light, the first thing I would do is find the light. It sounds very simple, but a good exercise just to help you to become a little more sensitive to what you have available is to hold out your hand and walk around to various spots in your home and just look at how the light wraps around your hand and what type of shadow it casts on the surface. I like to think of light as a liquid. So when you have this three-dimensional textural object, food, especially when it's monochromatic food, like whole grains, then what really makes the food sing is when you create contrast. And you do that by lighting the food from the side, the left, the right, slightly to the back of the food. You can backlight food. That does work if you're shooting overhead. If you're shooting very low in backlighting, you'll just need to work a bit more with that manual exposure that I mentioned. But in general, when you have light coming front right on the food, then you lose the beautiful high brights and dark, dark lows that make that contrast, that make it look like you want to just reach in and take it. On these two examples I just put here, the top example is in the studio, um, and the bottom one is a big uh, window to the right of the focaccia. And on the top example, you see the, the light was on the left-hand side of the food since the shadows go towards the right. So two different lighting scenarios, but both uh, side lighting just to bring out that texture and not flatten the food. The next thing I would do after finding the light and where I want to be is to look at the color of it. If there is a competing light source, if you're at home and there's any other lamp that's warmer than daylight, then turn it off so you just have one color temperature and that's daylight. When I was in restaurants, it was always harder when you can't turn off certain lights. So what I would do is just do what I could with blocking it with black cards. If the light was lower, I would cover it with gaff tape if they let me. Um, just to keep it a clean, one color, one directional light source. And we don't have double shadows and mixed colors. Now, sometimes you might notice outside a window, there's a bunch of trees. And then your hand, when you're walking around, looks green and tinted green. The auto white balance in most of your cameras should fix that. But if you need to adjust for that later, um, without doing a custom white balance in camera, you can do that later while editing the image. The last thing I look for after finding the light and making sure the color of the light is clean is how much light there is. If there's a lot of light, that can be modified. If there's beautiful light, but there's not a lot of it, that's when my tripod came into play. So again, with the manual exposures, I would get on the tripod, set a slower, uh, longer exposure, and you have beautiful light, but since you're able to lock it down and not move, you can take advantage of the quality of light and just compensate for it not being enough. So once you have this basic setup going with the window over to the left or the right of the food, take a look at your shot and you can see if the side opposite of the window really needs some more light. Maybe the contrast is really beautiful or maybe it needs just a touch of light. So you can take white foam core board, score it so it stands on its own or get those presentation boards and just set it to the side of the food. See if it fills in, it's reflecting way too much light. If suddenly your whole scene is too bright and you don't have that beautiful high and low, then you might want to move the board further away from the food so you're not filling in as much into the shadows. One place I love shooting with natural light was the garage. So if you have access to one, it makes an amazing location for food photos because you have one large, soft, 
light source that's directional. Likely there's no other competing windows in there. And if you get direct sun in there, which is usually not the case, but if that happens, then a sheer shower curtain can um, just create some amazing softer light. Um, and so this soba noodle bowl, you can see I shot that in my garage and the light was coming from the back. So I was facing the garage opening and then you can see the light rakes over the texture and you have that shadow at the bottom of the bowl. Um, there's, I think, you know, when you're, when you're wandering around just investigating light in your home, there may be a door somewhere where there's amazing light. I don't know if it's in a hallway. Um, even if it's not somewhere you'd expect, you might be able to prop open the door and then shoot on a small area of the floor and uh, find some surprising spots. To summarize your basic toolkit, these little things I got by for a few years with very minimal equipment. And the thing is when you do know how to find the light and modify it, there's you don't need a lot. So essentials I would say are white foam core board. Those presentation boards are awesome because they're already scored and will stand on their own. Um, black foam core board, which if you hold the black foam core board to the side of food, it does soak up some light. Um, and you can play around with different placement. If you need to, if there's another window, you know, off to the opposite side of your main window source, you might have a black card up just to make sure you're blocking other competing light. Um, one other cool thing is the black and white plastic needle point screen. And so if you, if you want to filter light, there's there's so many different ways you can do this, but if you want something very uniform that isn't completely blocking the light but still cuts it down, this needle point screen, screen is awesome for that. Um, you can put glassware in front of harsh light and cast shadows to filter light. Some people like parchment paper, even just stuck up in a window where you're getting direct sun. For me, I find that the parchment paper diffuses it a little too much because even with soft light, I still want to see some soft you know, definition in the shadow. So for that, I do love the five-in-one round diffuser reflector. And they, you'll see this little picture here, it's one disc and there's, you can turn it to the black side, the solid white, there's the part that I used to use all the time, and it was just sheer diffusion material. But that traveled with me everywhere. And with that and the tripod, I was good to go. But as I said, you can use shower curtains and there's there's other substitutions, but this round disc, there is something about when you put that right in direct sun, it does diffuse the light, but it also fills things in a little bit in a way, there's something a little luminous about it. So. If you can get one of those, they're fairly affordable and you can play around with different methods of working with the light. The quality of light is the thing. It's in photography, of course, it's the most important thing. But for me, I love composition just as much and likely because of my background in painting and studio art. And of course, there are rules. I won't get into rule of thirds and the rest of that. But what I would like to invite you to do, much like your exercise of staring at your hand and <laughs> thinking about it, is to just look at paintings, look at photographs. You can make it, you know, go to the museum or just look at photos online in magazines and let your eyes go on a journey and travel through the frame. Don't overthink it, just uh, kind of notice and ask yourself, where does my eye start? Where does it go next? How is it led through the frame? Where does it stop? Does it exit the frame or come back? When you're shooting your own photos, you can do this. You'll get better and more sensitive to it. And you might find that something is very distracting and not on purpose. Um, just like the flat front lighting, you know, sometimes you do things on purpose, but you can remove a distraction or maybe it's some silverware on the surface that is pointing in a direction that kind of makes you pause and uncomfortable and your eye has to go back to where you wanted to fo it to focus so you know you can change angles of lines you can take things away that are distracting in general 
your eye will likely go to the brightest spot in the photo. So sometimes on food photos, there might be some bright thing up in the corner that your eye get, keeps getting pulled up to, and I'll change it. I'll remove it or change the crop. With composition, you can explore different angles. You can, of course, go overhead. That works very well with iPhones. You can go straight into it, high rise and level, or a high three-quarter angle. Um, you can do macro shots like this pasta shot that I shared. And there's a hierarchy. So usually there's a hero. In this top shot with the eggs, you can see there's not really a hero. It's kind of just this little dance throughout this frame and everything is actually cropped off. Usually I have one thing that's entirely in the frame, but instead it just is feels tight and cozy and you kind of just stay within this little trio, this circle, circle kind of feeling of the composition. So with the pasta below, that was there was a lot more in, that I could have shot, but, you know, it's just a pattern, but what I saw in it was this nice little diagonal line where it starts to curl. And that's what I loved was how this curling just kind of went diagonally through the frame. For the content of the image, with that, I include styling. Like I said, in, journal in photojournalism, it's the, uh, the story that you're telling. Um, I've been lucky to work with incredible stylists, but when I started out and I was alone, you know, I experimented on my own and um, I, I picked up things from stylists that I could do on a smaller scale at home. And one thing that I love um, that I think in Boston, Katrine Kelty is so wonderful at is just not being afraid of the food. She digs into things, you know, you can get that safe shot when the when you're you've plated it. But then just think of how you might enjoy it with friends. And she digs into things and shows various stages of it being broken into. And even like this shot on the bottom, you know, the tomatoes, it's not actually even fully dug into, but she has those remnants of tomatoes from that moment of you just completed making it. For propping, it's a personal preference. And I think there's times when bold, bright colors make sense. But often, I really love sticking to a more neutral palette that lets the food just be the hero. And even, I think, if you have beautiful light on more beige foods, if you bring about all of that contrast, you, may, you don't necessarily need to shoot on some really bright color opposite from the color of the bread. Um, for Roxana... Julia Pat's Mother Grains book, most of that book was actually shot on white surfaces, on pale cutting boards, it was very neutral, and that was kind of the palette of the book, but it was really all about the texture of all of the grains. So we only used color very oc occasionally in that book. For this little example up top, I pulled it because that surface is actually just a piece of scrapbook paper from Michael's. It's a very small little sheet of paper. So if you're, when you're finding the light around your home, it might be nice to have these little scraps of fabric or papers or a good, mar even marble contact paper I've used and I've stuck to foam core board. And they're just lighter and easily, easy for you to move around wherever you want not, without having these heavy stones. And it, and it works, you know. And, and as just as a side note, with the lighting, you can see I was actually in my garage and it, the sun was coming through I was closer to the opening of the garage and the dark shadow was from just a piece of black foam core board and then I put the glassware in just experimenting with shadow as a prop because even without and you know being in the shot the shadow is an element it's part of the scene so embrace the shadows and don't be afraid of negative space these are a couple more images for Mediterranean Everyday by Sheila Prakash, also styled by Katrine Kelty. And for books, we, we're often thinking about where text can go in books, so this makes sense. But even as standalone images, you might find when you are shooting, you want to experiment with not shooting everything so literally and showing everything. You know, think about, again, those shadows being an element of the scene and a little mystery. You don't need to see that whole bottle of olive oil because we're not shooting an ad. 
but we're trying to just capture a feeling. Finally, when you're all done shooting, most images could benefit from a little bit of a contrast adjustment, some white balance fine tuning, and maybe saturation depending on preference. This has been such a quick overview of so much, but I hope you found some helpful, helpful bits. And there are so many great resources online. There's Creative Live, which has free classes if you catch it live. And there's also some great YouTube instructors. One that is very good is The Bite Shot. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed and have fun with this. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Let me pull up. <clears throat> Our next PowerPoint. Can I just move? Okay. So next up, we're going to hear from Sharon Palmer, who is a registered dietitian and cookbook author. So I will just let you take it away, Sharon. Thank you so much. Uh, do you want to advance the slide, please? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, my name is Sharon Palmer, and I'm a registered dietitian. I call myself the plant power dietitian. And uh, I do a variety of things, uh, including writing cookbooks. I have a blog. Um, I do presentations. I'm in the media. So food photography is something that I had to start learning to do. And I'm by no means an expert. But in this day and age, we all have to start getting more involved with food photography, I believe, as registered dietitians. You know, no matter if you're a supermarket dietitian, a blogger like myself, or even if you're a clinical dietitian and you want to do more interesting education, I think food photography, food photography fits in really well as a great skill in your toolbox. So I think that when you have a well-crafted food photo, you it's like a piece of art and it provides inspiration for your clients so that they can really see what a healthy, delicious diet looks like. So my last book, California Vegan, I actually did all the food photography for that book, including the cover, which was a huge challenge for me, but it's something that is interesting. It's fun. It's creative. This is another shot on the right here. Uh, I live in Ojai, California, and it was uh, taken at a winery where I gathered all these foods together. So, you know, learning about food photography, a lot of it came along the way doing webinars like this. I actually went to community college in my neighborhood and took a food photography class. I invested in some basic equipment and it's just practice, practice, and really just refining your skill a little bit. Do you want to uh, share the next slide, please? So one of the things I love about food photography is you can connect people with your food stories. So for example, this recipe is for my mother's uh, vintage recipe uh, uh, box that I inherited. It was for a tamale pie, a vegetarian tamale pie. I found that recipe and kind of tweaked it a little bit. It made it vegan. So every time I, I think about that, recipe, I think about these memories, and I think we can create these stories for our clients too, no matter what area we're working in. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of benefits for food photography. As a dietitian, as a healthcare professional, I can bring my nutrition lessons to life. So, you know, think about your education pieces. When you've got a food photo, it makes it so much more interesting. This is a photo I took on a farm tour in California in an artichoke field with my iPhone. So, you know, that just makes that, that information more interesting. You can use it in your cooking classes, in your workshops, in your community events. You can use your own food photos because people will know it's you. They'll know the difference between stock photos and something that you created yourself. Um, it can also you know, create better client education materials. And then when you're doing things like writing uh, magazines, blogs, uh, uh, for books, it can really elevate those and not to mention social media, you know, more and more dietitians are on social media. So our food photos have to be more elevated and it's a great marketing tool. If you can do your own food photography, that is a really great skill that you can market. Next slide, please. 
So as a dietitian, I think about the different messages that I want to bring out with my food photography. For example, if it's nutrition education, let's share some pictures of food, some beautiful, delicious foods. For example, I, I go to the farmer's market every weekend. I'm taking pictures with my iPhone all the time of beautiful food because then I think, oh, I have uh, something I'm doing on green leafy vegetables. Let's throw in my photo at the farmer's market. And then also sometimes collecting your ingredients together when you're talking about cooking, it can make it more accessible, like this shot on the on the top right. This is a super easy pasta recipe. I want to show what those main ingredients are, and I think it, it makes it more accessible to, to people. And then on social media, you want it to be colorful and beautiful and inviting. So a photo like the bottom, my gato gato dish is something that does well on social media. And then the bottom right is a little photo I did for a back to school um, newsletter I did. So I just collected these things that kind of felt like back to school. So, you know, thinking about what you're doing with the photos can, can make a difference. Next slide, please. So this is what my setup looks like. I live in Ojai, California, as I said, and I have this amazing window and it has a Southern exposure. And this little pine table, the previous owner left it when he moved out. And it's an old antique pine table with a lot of texture in it. I just love it. So that's kind of my place where I do food photos. And as we were learning about the different angles of the natural light, I can use that. I can add more light. You can see on the right, I've added some light um, to one of my food shots there. But this is just a really easy thing because it's in my living room. It's just steps away from my kitchen. So this is my favorite food photo area. And even my dogs on the bottom like, like it. They have to sniff out my food. And then here I am in my kitchen. Here's a shot in my kitchen. This was for a webinar um, that was a, a culinary webinar. So that's a little bit different, but you can see like how I'm using, I used a, a ladder to put my laptop. I've got one here today too, just, just to really bring in these angles that I was looking for when it comes to more of those kinds of photos. Next slide, please. So I use a lot of different background. And as we've been learning, I look for good lighting, natural and artificial lighting. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples of my props, but I use different backgrounds. I know I have my favorite background is that pine table. And one of the things when you're working in social media, sometimes consistency can be nice because people know your aesthetic. So I know a lot of food bloggers that use the exact same background for all their shots. So it looks uniform, people recognize it. But this is just a marble, um, the first shot is a marble uh, cutting board. And then the second shot is my outdoor coffee table. So I just, I love the, the wood texture there and it has really great lighting. So one of the things that's important for me is I'm not a full-time photographer. So I have to make this easy. I don't have hours to shoot photos. So I have to really be organized. I, a lot of times my recipes that I'm developing, they're for dinner tonight, you know? So I've been working on the recipe. I have, you know, just a little bit of time to shoot it. So having these items that I need, having a great background that I know I have good lighting can make it simple and easy for me. Next slide, please. So these are some of the other backgrounds I've used. Now, here's my, on the top, here's my little pine table again, but my wall is painted this creamy plaster wall. So that's like this pretty background. And I like to use a lot of flowers. I like, my aesthetic is bringing nature inside. You know, my whole platform is plant-based nutrition, sustainability. So I want to just bring that organic feel into what I'm doing. So I love to bring all the elements of the outdoors of the garden into what I'm doing. So this photo below of the corn is on my picnic table outside. I have some beautiful natural light. And so literally I just put that on before we ate. You know, of course I did some styling. I adjusted my settings on my camera, but that's an example of what I've done. I also, when I'm I was doing something on whole grains and I just took this jar of whole grains out to, to this beautiful view uh, outside where it was green and there was this pasture and I just held it up and with my iPhone there. So that was just something I could use when I'm writing about whole grains. And then on the right, I've also used these kind of backdrops that you can easily find. They have this surface. It's, this is a white marble uh, top with subway tile. So then I've added some artificial light and you can see on the top the result of that. But these are things that you can use. You can find quite easily. They're not expensive. Um, and you can kind of see my composition. This was an olive oil cake. So I brought in some uh, clippings from my olive trees and from my clippings from my orange trees for that shot. 
Next slide, please. So some of the things that I have invested in, again, not a lot of money. I did get a Canon um, camera, the cheapest one they had at Costco, and I've had it for a long time, a DSLR, and that really elevated my food photography. So I usually use that. I will use iPhone um, 2 when I'm more like out and about, but I do tend to rely on that. I've gotten some basic lighting, you know, some box lighting, just some very basic lighting. I have tripods and selfie sticks. I have some props and I'm going to show you some examples, but a lot of props I use, I already have. Like for example, this shot of a banana coconut muffin, it's a recipe I made that's just filled with, with things like banana flour, coconut flour. It's got mashed bananas. It's got coconut in there. And I have a banana tree growing outside. So I just clipped that leaf and brought it in because I thought it, it matched the theme of what we were, what I was writing about and um, shooting. So you can use things like that. And then I've got like a Japanese teapot with a tea uh, cup there. But I collect all sorts of equipment. It's not expensive. Um, I use vintage things, things that have been handed down to, through my family, which I think brings personality. And I'll sometimes share those details. Um, I collect individual napkins, so there are a lot of things that you can do for props, things that you already have. And then of course I use an editing software. Um, I think we're gonna be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, I use Lightroom at the end. Next slide, please. But it doesn't have to be fancy. And I know a lot of bloggers who don't even have, uh, you know, the fancy cameras are using their iPhone. My camera broke, broke down one week and I took this picture of this uh, peanut Chinese cabbage salad with my iPhone. And then this shot on the right was just last week at a restaurant, you know, and I use this on social media just with my iPhone. So you, you can start with that. Next slide, please. And then one thing I think is really engaging is if you're a nutrition professional, take pictures of yourself and include those in your shots. These are the most popular ones I have on social media. When I include a photo of myself and not just the food, it resonates with people it makes them realize this, there's a living person behind that shot and they're enjoying this healthy lifestyle. So I'm always taking photos of me at the farmer's market and they, people love to see what's in season, you know, what, what's in my basket. And then this is a photo of me foraging wild greens. So I was writing something on foraging and that's a popular shot. And then finally on the right, whenever I'm doing um, my really nice beauty shots of my food, I will set up my tripod and on my iPhone, take a quick picture of myself for social media with that food. And people love to see that, you know, they want that human um, connection. Next slide, please. So we already learned a little bit about angles. These are some that I like to use. I think for food photos, the shot down is so beautiful. Um, this is a skillet uh, cobbler, but then I also like to be involved with my photos. I like to hold things. And I notice that those photos do the best. They get the most impressions on social media. So, and also you can, you can show the angles and you can make it look like you're about to take a bite out of it. Putting in the silverware that, you know, makes it more interactive. And this is again on my pine table. Next slide, please. Um, and this just shows you different angles and dimensions I've used for a recipe. This is a curried lentil dip that's going in my next book. And, you know, the shot down tighter and then at an angle and then the vertical. Having all these different angles is great for social media, different platforms. And also I, I use a variety of photos on my blogs too. Next slide, please. So when it comes to my composition, as I said, I love to bring nature inside. I love to showcase whole plant foods. So this photo on the left is my vegan chocolate cream pie. And that is my mother's antique Limoges uh, plate that's actually a coffee saucer and one thing when you're doing photography I find that using smaller dishes makes the food um, seem more impressive if you have that chocolate pie on this bigger plate it just gets lost so using smaller size plates for, for your food photography is going to really be uh, helpful then I piled uh, berries on there some pomegranates for my tree and a pansy from my garden so I grow my own edible uh, flowers for, for my food photography, as well as my herbs. I have a vegetable garden and it doesn't have to be big. You know, pansies are edible. They grow really easily. You can have them in your pot, just pluck them. So I do like to use photos of with um, flowers. This is my raspberry salsa in the middle here. So I have like fresh from the farmer's market, my little tub of raspberries. I've got a bunch of green onions and then like having those 
those tortilla chips kind of shows you what we're going to eat with that salsa. And then on the top is the sage lentil pie. And I, I liked this rustic quality where you're just digging in. And literally when I took that photo, steam was coming up. But that feeling is there. And uh, something like a lentil pie can really not photograph very well. It's like a lot of beige and brown. But putting it in a smaller dish, again, that's a vintage dish that's been in my family, that kind of captures it. It doesn't just spread all over the plate. You have to worry about some foods just spreading on the plate and looking not so attractive. And then on the bottom, I have like these baked falafels where I've introduced some seasonal vegetables in there. I have my little uh, tasting, so dipping sauce on the side, sprinkled it with uh, some fresh cilantro. Next slide, please. So the other thing is making it colorful. And as I mentioned, sometimes we're working with these foods like refried beans. I mean, it's just brown. It doesn't have as much texture. So I like to introduce a lot of color. I put my hand in there taking a, a dip. So that makes a little more interest. I've got some chips. I've got some flowers from my herb garden, some other like tomatoes from my garden, the avocado on the side. So that to me makes that much more inviting than if I had, can you imagine if I didn't have those elements on that? food shot. People love color on uh, social media. Color is actually a big trend right now in food overall. Colorful foods are really hot right now. So this is my rainbow pizza and then I add all these produce items that were colorful on the side. And the bottom, I've got a bowl, a turmeric rice bowl, and bowls are very popular. They look beautiful in food photography, the bowls do. They're doing really well. Um, and I like to put things in twos a lot of times when I'm doing bowl recipes that that uh, pairing with two bowls really can look nice on food photos. And then on the bottom right, this is a new photo uh, of a grilled tofu corn salad. And then, so I'm introducing some of the ingredients. I love to have like a whole bunch of radishes rather than one radish. So you can see the leaves, you know, it just it's just coming to life. I like my photos to really have that vibrance like it's alive. Next slide, please. You can also include themes, like for example, these are some Swedish ginger cookies. So I introduced, you know, the Christmas tree, my Christmas uh, cookie jar. For my fruit pops in the summertime, I'm adding a sunflower because I just want it to feel like it's warm and it's sunshine and I want to eat that fruit pop. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned a little bit about getting interactive, but the, the photos that do the best for me are ones that I'm involved in it. So like dipping up that uh, vegan yogurt dressing to drizzle on that bowl, holding things in my hands, uh, cookies, things that look really nice, holding a veggie burger in my hands, like I'm ready to take a bite. Those photos do really well. This bottom photo of this lentil uh, bolognese is one of my most popular photos. I think it does well because I'm like in there, like twisting the pasta with my um, left hand and then I'm taking the photo with my right hand. And uh, I'm not, I didn't use a tripod. A lot of times I'm just doing this, you know, right on the fly. And it's just like, it's so, you know, comforting and I'm just ready to just eat it. And I think that's why this photo is doing well. And then things like, you know, this was a, a photo for an article on some healthy plant foods. This is hemp seeds and hemp seeds can look kind of boring on a photo, but I'm holding it up in a jar with this background. So those are some things you can do to actually show that you're part of that photo. Next slide, please. And then the serving containers are important. You know, as I mentioned, if you use two large pla platters and plates, it just gets lost. It's hard to take a nice photo of it. So I collect uh, uh, lots of containers. Things that have a little rim is nice because it kind of keeps the food in place. I use a lot of vintage things. Like this is an, um, a hand carved wooden scoop that's been in our family. I use it for granola. The bottom, this recipe is a one pot uh, mac, uh, vegan mac and cheese. So I wanted to keep that pot in that photo to show that, you know, you can just plop it on the dining table and, you know, it's not fussy. And on the right, this is my mermaid smoothie bowl. And I love to use glass jars, things like weck jars. Uh, they look really great in food photos. Plus you can imagine just putting the lid on that and throwing it in the fridge. Like this now is an easy thing to make. Next slide, please. And then I like to show the process. Um, so if I'm making cookies, these are uh, lemon basil shortbread cookies. I could show the bowl of the dough being mixed with a wooden spoon in it. I can show it coming right out of the oven. So those are other things you can do. Next slide, please. 
And then don't be afraid to get messy. People are really uh, getting you know, messier with their food photos, like a smoothie that's dribbling over the side and globs of sauce, like you're just like throwing the sauce on. Next slide, please. And again, be in the photo. Even if you don't have your hands in the photo, make it look like you're involved, like you're taking that cookie off the cookie sheet right now. You're serving up a, a square of this chocolate zucchini cake and you're putting it right on that little plate and somebody's just gonna dig right in. So, so really being interactive, I think is, is very inviting. Next slide, please. And then photo editing. I know we're gonna learn more about this, but this is just an example of a photo that I took on my trusty pine table. You can see my Birkenstocks at the bottom. So I knew I was gonna crop all that out, but you can see with my lighting, um, the original shot with no editing. And then I, I cropped out my feet. I got a better angle. I did a little editing uh, in Lightroom. So this, should, this is something that I did just last week. So you can see how easy it is to do that. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna show a few of my own examples, but I also wanted to share uh, my newsletter. You can sign up for my social media, follow me, and you can reach out to me there. If you have any questions, I'd love to help you. But I do wanna show you a few of my favorite props. So I think we're gonna, okay. Here we go. So um, I'm in my kitchen here. You probably recognize the photo, the photos from my kitchen, but oh, I like to use a lot of different surfaces. Um, for example, I have uh, I have this I have this marble. Here we go. I have a marble cutting board. So that has been in a lot of food photos. I also have um, I have this tile that I got from. The Kind of loud here. I got this from Home Depot. This is just a tile, but it kind of gives you this look of like an old stone. That would be super easy for uh, food photos, and I've used that before too. I also collect a lot of different um, serving utensils. So, for example, spoons and knives and forks. I just get one of them, right? So, whenever you're in a store and you see like just one spoon, you know, like, hey, that's a cool spoon. Wouldn't that be really great in a new recipe? So I just collect single ones of these. Vintage is so great too. If you're in a vintage shop, you just get one. They add a lot of texture. Like when you look at these anti uh, silver spoons, they can add a lot of texture and interesting things. So I just collect those. Another thing I do is collect um, kitchen towels and napkins. So I'm always like finding different colors and textures I think would look great in food photos, different patterns. So then I'm just looking at that. I just grab what I have. And I can use it as a backdrop. I can use it to like almost like a pot holder by a, a pot or a pan or like a napkin to add a little pop of color. You can squish them up. You can lay them out, different types of things. So you're just collecting these along the way to single napkins. You can also look at different um, serving bowls. So I think I had a food photo of these. These are vintage bowls that have been in my family a long time. They're kind of like art deco looking, but this is a great size for food photography. I can do a bowl meal, like a grain bowl. I can do soup. I can do a salad. But bowls are great for photos because you can get nice side angles. They hold the ingredients together. They're a nice size for shooting. And then when you have the two together, you can do some interesting things. With it. I also use like little skillets, you know, like for single serving. These look great on food shots when you're doing a skillet meal or something like that. Here's another bowl that I found. So I have two of these. So this is another great bowl shot. Now, sometimes white is really a great go-to for food photos because white just lets the food shine. But sometimes I will use some other colors too, but um, I try, it just depends on the food shot I'm looking at. This is another handy bowl that I got. I've got two of these. This one does really well in food shots. And then even things like glasses. I, I mentioned that I love wet jars. They come in different sizes. So these are great for, for dipping sauces you might have on the side um, or even like a smoothie bowl, a chia pudding. So these are great because you can see all the way through. I just love the, uh, the dimensions of these. You can also put like a little cup of coffee on the side as a prop. And so espressos uh, cups are nice because they're not quite so big. They don't take up so much real estate in your photo. So just a little espresso cup can be nice as a little prop on the side. And then um, also, I will use mason jars. This is an antique mason jar. It doesn't always photograph well for what I'm doing, but sometimes I will use that. 
I also use tweezers every once in a while when I'm putting on a garnish just to make sure it's getting on there right or removing an onion that doesn't look great. So these tweezers are really handy as well. So um, also when it comes to plates, I like to use saucers. These have a cute little blue and green scalloped edge. But this is a great size for entrees because when you have that large dinner plate, a lot of times it doesn't look great on food photos. And then finally, as I mentioned, I like to bring nature into my food shots. So I'm using a lot of herbs. I have an herb garden and the herbs will go to flowers. That can be a pretty element. So just going out and picking some fresh herbs to, to slice over the up over that. Some cherry tomatoes. I just picked these from my garden with a little stem. Slices of avocado can really elevate something. So these are some of the things that I like to, to share in my food photography. So thank you. I'm going to turn it back to Old Ways. Thank you so much, Sharon. I'm a little jealous of your garden. Uh, thanks for sharing all those beautiful photos. Next up, we're going to hear from Alexis Evangelos, our resident food uh, photo expert and phenomenal graphic designer at Old Ways. Uh, we're eager to hear your tips, Alexis. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking to you guys about some basic food editing uh, for, uh, basic photo editing for food photography. Um, so I'm gonna just share some beginning techniques uh, for how um, to make your images just look a little more polished and appetizing. Uh, all photos, both ones taken by professionals and amateurs benefit from photo editing. Uh, using your editing software can be about creating a certain mood or look. It can also be used to compensate for less than ideal lighting. Uh, it's not a perfect substitute. Uh, nothing is for great lighting, but it definitely can help. So in terms of editing software, there are a variety of both paid and free options for editing your photos, and there are ones available for desktop use and mobile use. Generally, the editing capabilities that are built into, say, your phone or apps like Instagram are nowhere near as robust as the ones that are available through dedicated editing software. So if you are serious about editing your photos, it's best to start exploring these kind of editing softwares. Uh, Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom are kind of the, the top of the pile here. They're both paid software options, and they're probably some of the most comprehensive and robust options. They both also have mobile versions available when you subscribe. Uh, Lightroom is what I'd recommend for most people. Photoshop is a more complex program, and it's really best only if you're planning to do more in-depth photo manipulation. So if you're planning on doing a lot of like removing extraneous uh, items that are in, in your image or editing them out. Uh, but for most people, I'd say Lightroom is the way to go. Um, there are also a lot of free apps for photo editing, particularly mobile editing, just because that's what a lot of people are doing now. Uh, the two popular ones that I've seen are Snapseed and VSCO, uh, but there are also a ton of other ones out there. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll be showing you screenshots from Lightroom because that's what I generally work in, but all of these techniques and adjustments can be found in any of these programs, and they'll mostly be using the same kind of terminology um, and a lot of times the same kind of slider mechanism. So this does uh, work in other programs as well. So the first and most basic thing that you'll wanna do when you're editing your photos is cropping and straightening. This gives you a lot of options, but mostly it's about cutting out extraneous things on the edges that you don't want. Also lets you adjust the focus of the image so that the final composition is highlighting the food, which is what you want. And you'll see on the right that this is the panel in Lightroom where you'd be making those adjustments. So it gives you the option for straightening, it gives you the option for cropping, and it'll impose uh, a little crop box over your image once you click onto it. So here's an example of where I'd wanna straighten an image. You can see that when the photo was taken, the camera was held at a slight angle, so the table looks crooked. It's gonna be more aesthetically pleasing to have the table look like it's level, so that's where we'd wanna straighten this image. You can see now it's level. 
However, straightening an image can also be a judgment call. Sometimes you want elements in your image to be at an angle. So you can also just play with rotating your images in your editing software, because that can also be part of your artistic process. Maybe not with a table. The table having a table straight is, is a pretty straightforward case. But if, for example, you have a tray of food, you may not want to have it be straight up and down, lined up with the edges of the photo. You might want to have it at an angle. And so maybe you'll rotate it in your image, uh, in your image editing software to, to make that adjustment. So here's an example of where I might want to crop part of an image. So we can see at the bottom edge of of the table is visible and at the top there's a little bit of the table visible from where the tablecloth didn't quite get uh, moved to the side. Both of these things are going to be a little distracting in your final image because it's going to take away from the focus of the food. So instead I might crop it. We can see in the second image that I've basically zoomed in on the image which is what you have to do if you're cropping out a section of the image. And that's going to basically give you a better looking final image. This is also an example of why it might be useful when you're taking photos to take them from more of a distance. That way you have more of the image to play with and crop as you see fit once you're editing. So instead of doing a automatically zoomed in photo when you're taking it, you can zoom in after in your post processing. And that just gives you a lot more flexibility. And it means that if, for example, you have the edge of the table, like I did here in your image that you weren't thinking about, it's easy to edit it out without having to, for example, here, uh, you know, crop the plate itself, which I might not have wanted to do. So the other big thing that we'll want to talk about is adjusting your lighting. Um, especially if you're photographing under less than ideal lighting, but even when you are photographing with great lighting, adjusting the lighting in your photo in post-processing is a, a big game changer. Um, as you'll see on the right, uh, there are quite a few options for editing lighting, and this is not even the extent of the lighting editing you could do in Lightroom, but um, really with these options, it's good to think about them as just being progressively more targeted. So exposure, which is the top one, is really just about how light or dark the image is overall. So that's the easiest one to start with. Contrast is the next is the next sort of level. Uh, it's a little bit more targeted, um, and we'll talk about that one in a bit. Uh, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks are even more advanced adjustments. If you're just starting out, you may not even touch these. You can make a lot of the adjustments with these exposure and contrast adjustments. Um, however, I will talk a little bit about using these as well shortly. So here I have an image that was taken in natural lighting. I haven't done any adjustments to the exposure yet, so it's just set at zero. So everybody will look at this differently and for what I might choose to do for it, another, uh, another photo editor might do something totally different, but we're going to explore some options. So if I move the slider, the uh, exposure slider to the negative side, I'm going to make the entire image darker. Now, you could probably say this isn't what we want, because uh, the image already looked a little dark to me when it was shot in natural light. Um, by making it darker here, we've lost a lot of the details in the image. The food doesn't look appetizing. So this is probably not the direction we'd want to go. Instead, I think that the image probably could be a little brighter, which is why I've moved the exposure slider here to the positive side. This makes both the light and dark parts of the image lighter. So this is maybe closer to something that I would want to, to use for a final image. On the next slide, which I'm not going to get to quite yet, we're going to move on to contrast. So this is contrast is an adjustment to how much difference there is between the light and the dark parts of an image. So if there's less contrast, that means that the light parts of the image are not especially light, but the dark parts are also not especially dark. So it's somewhere in the middle. So I hope you could see that transition from the slide. I'll go back once. And then I'll go back again so you can see it again. So here, this image looks a little more flat and dull. Generally, when we are 
photographing food, we want more contrast, which I think has been mentioned a couple of times in, in uh, the other presentations. Um, that just adds more visual interest, it's more appealing. Uh, this, of course, is a judgment call, depending on the ultimate goals for your image or the content of your image. You'll want to play around with the contrast until you get an effect you like. So when we increase the contrast, however, we're making the light parts lighter and the dark parts darker. So here you can see we've added kind of more drama to the image. And this is a style that people tend to like more in food photography. I might say that I've exaggerated the contrast a little bit so you can see the effect here more clearly. Um, but again, you'll notice a theme in what I'm talking about. This is all about your personal preference and what, what you like as a style for your food editing. So you'll just wanna spend time adjusting the sliders until you think the result looks good for you. So there's something that I noticed when I adjusted the contrast here. I noticed that there's maybe some of the light areas in the image that are too light in my opinion, in particular, this spot on the bowl. So I'm gonna show you how I might fix that. So I hope you could see that transition. I'll go back and come back again so you can see it again. What I did here is I've reduced the highlights in the image. So that's the next slider down from contrast in Lightroom. This basically makes the very lightest parts of the image darker, but it doesn't affect any other part of the image. Unlike if I were to have used the exposure or the contrast slider, which would have impacted a, a, a wider range of the, of the light in the image. You'd use the shadow slider in the same way if you wanted to make the darkest parts of your image even darker. So I won't go into adjusting whites and blacks as much uh, because those are just even more specific adjustments. Uh, white highlights and shadows, uh, sorry, well, highlights and shadows adjust the lightest and darkest parts of the image. White and black, as their name might indicate, adjust only the true white and black parts of the image. So again, it's just another step down from the light and dark adjustments. So the next thing you'll probably want to be adjusting is the color of the image. So the overall color. When I'm talking about temperature, I'm talking about how warm or cool the colors appear. Uh, generally, food photography aims for warmer images because they're more appetizing. But again, there may be instances where you don't want that and you want a cooler image. Um, but generally, will be when you're adjusting the temperature of an image, you're going to want to be either going for no hue or a warmer hue. Adjusting the saturation and the vibrance also make a really big difference to your image. Both basically add more color to your image. The way that we perceive a plate of food or, or anything and the way that looks in a photo are often very different. Often food looks more brighter and vibrant in person than it does on camera. So when we're adjusting vibrance and saturation, what we're doing is trying to bring some of that back into our image and not baking it too exaggerated. So here I have an image that hasn't been adjusted. Um, and so we can see in the next image that I have brought the sli slider down negative, which means that I'm adjusting the color cooler. So basically I added cool colors to the image. So you can see, I'll go back and go forward again, how there's kind of a blue cast to it. Especially with whole grains, this isn't something you necessarily want. Grains are, are warm, uh, you know, browns and rich reds. And so we wanna really lean into that. So here, I've increased the temperature so that it's warmer. Uh, this emphasizes their natural warm colors. Again, I've maybe exaggerated the effect a little bit here so that you can see it clearly. And you'll ultimately want to keep playing around with the slider to get it in a place that you want. I won't talk about tint very much, but that's right below the temperature slider. And that's another way of adjusting for color. For example, uh, if your image has what looks like a green cast from when you were photographing, you might adjust that slider toward the purple side to compensate for it or vice versa. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about vibrance and saturation some more. Uh, so you can see in this image, there are a bunch of different colors 
I just want to bring them out a little bit more and make this look more appetizing. So here I've added both vibrance and saturation. This is the trickiest one because it's it's very easy to oversaturate your images and make them look unnatural, which you don't want. So because vibrance is a more targeted adjustment, meaning that it is just at the muted colors, it's just going to bring the muted colors into a brighter color, I've increased that more than I've increased the saturation. So the vibrance is at plus 30, the saturation is at plus 15. Again, this is as with everything, a judgment call, I might want to saturate it more, I might want to saturate it less, really just depending on what the look is that I'm going for. So this was a very, very basic overview. There is so much more to color editing and to light editing that you could do, but this was also a lot. So if this seems a little overwhelming, I want to step back. The two biggest changes that you can make to your images are generally related to exposure and saturation, especially if you're not using professional lighting, if you're using um, just natural lighting, or even if you're you know, taking a picture in your kitchen, your images will likely benefit from increasing the exposure and increasing the saturation. As I mentioned, the camera tends to dull the images, so you wanna bring back a little extra color. And if you think about images that you see, generally they feel darker um, if they've been taken by a, a cell phone or something like that, especially if the light isn't very natural, increasing the exposure is gonna help you with that. And as I've said throughout this presentation, there is no specific setting that will be perfect for any, every image. It's a matter what uh, you think looks best. So the more you experiment, the better. And look at other people's photos. Look at what you like. Does it look like they use a lot of contrast? Do the lights look very light? Do the darks look very dark? Or is it more in the middle? Do they use a lot of saturation? Does it look overly saturated? Do you like that? So exploring what you like and what you don't like with each of the different sliders is really the, the easiest way to learn. And lastly, the point of food photos is to make them look good enough to eat. Don't overuse these effects because they'll more often than not make the food look unnatural. When you're adjusting the sliders, less is more, and every adjustment that you're making is going to have an impact on other adjustments you've made. So if you're increasing the brightness, you're also probably increasing the saturation a little bit. The colors are going to look bolder just because they're brighter. So there's a lot of trial and error that's going to go into photo editing. And it will become much easier once you have a few photos under your belt. Um, and if you are just sort of thinking about what you like and what aesthetic you're going for, that's also going to be very helpful because you can have kind of an end goal in mind for your photo. So that's my presentation. I hope this was helpful. Um, there's a lot of resources online about photo editing as well. But really, there's no substitute for getting into a photo editing program uploading one of your images and trying it out, just moving the slider all the way to one end, all the way to the other end and seeing what happens, because that's how you're going to learn. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexis. Lots of good tips there. I realize that we are running out of time. We're a little bit over. Um, I just want to share a few pieces of information about Whole Grains Month. So bear with me while I pull up the PowerPoint. Okay, so now that we've got all these new tips, tricks and skills to practice, I wanted to give you a quick overview of Whole Grains Month and, and let you know that there are ways that you can uh, start applying this knowledge right away. So if you weren't already aware, September is Whole Grains Month and we've got lots of different activities lined up. So throughout the month, we're posting fun daily whole grain challenges and inviting you to join us. Uh, many of these involve photography of, of food items you've created or eaten. Um, and I'll go into more detail on that, uh, about that in just a moment. We're also hosting weekly whole grain conversations with experts on Instagram Live. So you can see the full lineup on our website, wholegrainscouncil.org slash month. 
Um, in addition to today's webinar, we also have one coming up on Wednesday, September 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and that will focus all on sorghum. So make sure to mark your calendars and uh, register on our website. And then finally, um, kind of as we culminate uh, our celebration at the end of the month, we'll be selecting one winning food bank or similar food related charity who will receive uh, over 100 cases of whole grain product that's being donated by 18 of our Whole Grains Council member companies. Uh, so just real quickly um, with the daily challenges, uh, this is a really great way to put your new photography skills to work. You can find links to our contest platform, both on social media, as well as on our website. And um, we have lots of challenges still to come in the, in the month. Um, things like, you know, making your own grilled cheese sandwich with whole grain bread and posting a photo of it um, on Facebook or uh, sharing a whole grain recipe with a friend and, and posting about that on Instagram. Um, and each challenge that you complete earns you an entry to win one of our six grand prizes. So winners receive a $100 check um, a rice cooker donated by USA Rice, as well as the opportunity to nominate their favorite food related charity for a chance to win those 100 plus cases of whole grain products. A quick thank you to all of our very generous Whole Grains Council member companies who are donating those products. Uh, we can't wait to find out where they're all going to end up. Uh, stay tuned, we'll, we'll do a blog post uh, in October kind of detailing where that all went. And now um, I would invite you to connect with us on social media. You can email with any questions. Um, I know we don't have much time, but I did wanna take a look at the questions that we've had come in and see if we can answer anybody's uh, requests here. So we've got a question. I think this is for you, Sharon. Um, you had a great artichoke picture and there's a question about whether you used an app to modify that. Um, I ran that through Lightroom very, very slightly. It, it didn't, I mean, it almost looked, that photo was so beautiful right on the farm. So you, so you really, and you know, the other thing you, you know, you have your editing software that comes with, um, your, your photo apps, right? So, so sometimes I'll just use those in that way. If you're, if you don't have the Lightroom or whatever, you can use those, those editing apps too. Great. So we've got someone who's curious about um, if you're taking photos in your kitchen at night and you need to use lighting, how do you avoid having the shadow of your camera or phone show up on the food? Um, especially if you're doing like an overhead photo. Do you have any tips, either one of you? I think Alexis is good at that. <laughs> yeah, I think if you're, you know, adjusting where the angle is with your, when you're actually taking the photo is your best bet to begin with. But then once you actually get into the photo editing software, that's a case where I'd actually suggest Photoshop because you might want to be kind of adjusting um, the very specific areas where you're seeing that shadow um, so that you can adjust just the shadow of that area. Um, there are ways to kind of select uh, particular parts of an image and adjust the color uh, just in that part. So that would be, um, I think, the, the easiest solution, although it, it is not a terribly easy solution. Thank you. And one more uh, question about the artichoke photo. Um, it's a popular one today. How did you get the beautiful blur in the background using your iPhone? And then also, is there anything that you need to do to protect your photos from copyright issues when you're posting online or on social media? So I use portrait mode. I use that a lot on my iPhone. If you want that blurred effect, it's great. I think I did it for that restaurant meal too that I showed. So experiment with the portrait mode uh, for some of your food photos on your iPhone. So I've had a, a lot of my uh, content stolen on internet, like all the time. It's every single day I have content stolen. And um, basically I have to contact the people and tell them to take it down. It's just a constant battle. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Alexis. 
Yeah, I mean, watermarks are one way to go, but that also just does detract from your image, unfortunately. Um, if you can find a way to add a cool watermark um, or just a little text in the corner, maybe putting it at an angle so it's harder for people to crop out, um, that can sometimes work. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing to deal with and a lot of people do deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I think this will be our last question. Um, do you systematically take different shots for different social media formats, or do you just kind of rely on cropping? Well, for me, I'm doing a lot of social media, so I will do the the horse uh, the vertical shots for Instagram exclusively. I, it's too hard for me to crop a horizontal photo to match that. So when I know I'm gonna, I always make sure I have some horizontal and uh, I'm probably getting my terminology wrong, vertical, like portrait mode, right? For Instagram, Facebook, I'm doing more of the horizontal. So I make sure I have a variety because then when I'm doing the photo editing, it's really hard for me to adjust that. It, a lot of times that you just can't get the photo the way you want it unless you shoot it at that angle. I don't know if you have the same issue, Alexis. Oh yeah, I definitely, before before you even get into the cropping and the straightening, you take a bunch of different shots with a bunch of different angles because the more you have to work with, the happier you'll be. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I take 50 photos I don't, of a, and you know, 75% of them are awful, you know? So <laughs> it's amazing, but yeah. All right, thank you so much for everyone who tuned in. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, someone did ask if it would be recorded and available. It, it will be. We'll email you. It's also going to be on our website. All of that will happen within the next week. Um, and so thank you again. Thanks uh, to everybody for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye.